If you're joining us, we're coming to you live from MetaView in Arlington, Texas, with the simple truth. And that's all we seem to uh, do is just talk about the Word of God and bring it to you, hopefully, a simple and clear explanation of what it says, breaking down the bite-sized chunks into smaller morsels we can easily digest. That's the point. Having said that, we're in Luke chapter 18, and let's go ahead and ask the Lord's blessing. Lord, we thank you for this day, for this time we have. We pray again, Lord, you would be with us with your Holy Spirit. Uh, that you tabernacle with us and you open our eyes, our ears, and the minds of our understanding to hear, see, and know what you have for us. In your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 So let's go to Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. Luke writes, Then he spoke a parable to them, that men ought always to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was a certain city, and a yeah, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God, nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Get justice for me, from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Mm -hmm. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said? And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Good question. So sometimes we read this and we kind of have a, a tendency or a temptation to compare the Lord with this unjust judge. And people might say, see how this unjust judge listens, but you need to be persistent because God's like that. When Jesus is not saying that at all, but rather he's applying a contrast, not a comparison. He's saying, you see the unjust judge, but don't you know my father is not like that. He is just. He will answer and he will answer speedily and he will do it thoroughly. You don't have to worry about my dad. When you pray to him, he will hear and he will answer. So it's not a comparison because God's not unjust. It's a contrast. See, the unjust judge belabored it. He said, oh, by this woman's continual coming to me, God never reacts like that when his children come to him. Oh, Mrs. Smith is praying to me again. What am I going to do? Angels, please bring me the holy earplugs. No, God's not like that at all. He, he loves to hear from his kids. And he loves to avenge them. Because you know what that means? Somebody's going to get a thump. And that's the enemy. And God just loves that. He, he loves avenging his kids and showing himself strong for his children. But that's accomplished when his children stop relying upon themselves and say, I'm at my wit's end. I rely upon you. And just let it go. Yeah. And then he says, okay, I got you now. That's why lifeguards won't go after a drowning swimmer. They wait until he stops struggling because the drowning person would otherwise pull down the lifeguard with him. So the lifeguard waits until the person stops. Then he'll go rescue him. The Lord's like that. You struggle, it's in your hands then. So this is not a comparison, but a contrast. Isn't God so much better than the unjust judge? I'm reading from my notes now. So won't he answer so much better than the judge? Remember that in answering, God is more concerned with our eternal need than our temporal need and will not answer with something harmful to us. So when he answers, we might think in ourselves, we might be like 18, 19 years old and say, Lord, I want that woman for my wife, or Lord, I want that man for my husband. And God looks in our future and says, no, that would be detrimental to you. And so he says, no. He's not answering for the short term according to what we want, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. He answers with our eternity in mind. And the long plan. He says, no, i got this person over here planned for you. This is the one. So the question, again from my notes, is... Are we so independent that we won't bring our concerns and requests or our needs to him first 
before we try and solve it on our own, our own problems. So God is ready to act. Prayer opens the door. Back to Luke 18, verse 9. Continuing where we left off, Luke 18, verses 9 through 14 says this. You know, this is going to be a really short study. Verse 9 says, And he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves, that, that, they, were more, that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Question number one, did God even hear the Pharisee? Absolutely not. God did not even hear the Pharisee's prayer. What's the evidence of that? The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He prayed with himself so others could hear. Oh God, thank you that I am not like that. Don't you know, I was watching a video online the other day about these pastors who were talking about flying in their private jets because they didn't want to associate with the common people. They believed they were holier than thou and that they would be tainted if they flew in a regular airplane with regular people. Pharisees, you'd think they just read this chapter and put themselves in. What did I write in my notes? I wrote in my notes Isaiah 65. And Isaiah 64. So we're not going to read the whole chapters, obviously. We'll just pick a few verses. Isaiah 65, verse 2, says this, I have stretched up my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts. If you skip down to verse 5, it says, Who keep, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am holier than thou. God said, these are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. So what does God think of those people who fly in their private jets and say, I'm holier than thou? Yeah. You're just smoke in my eyes. You burn me up. <laughs> you burn me up. Yeah. You want to call yourself a pastor of my sheep? And you're not willing to get yourself dirty in the mud where the sheep are? Then you're disqualified. You are no longer qualified to be my pastor. Am I saying it's, you can't fly in private jets? Absolutely not. What I'm saying is the attitude, the heart, is the matter God's concerned about. It's not what we have because it's okay to be rich and a Christian. It's what's in your heart that matters. If that's affecting your relationship with the Lord, He's going to deal with it because he, he says... Don't have any other gods before me. He will not share his glory with another. Not your silver, not your gold, not your jet. And if that means more to you than your relationship with Christ, you need to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Yes? Think how many opportunities they miss of witnessing to other people on the plane. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. Yeah. That they're on their own little clip. Yeah. Man, if I was on a flight with a plane, uh, with a guy like that, I'd say, hey, man, before we start, why don't you just stand up and bless this flight? <laughs> you know, we have the stewardesses going, if you exit to the right and left, the flotation device will keep you alive or whatever. You know, exits for the front and the back of the plane. Um, and now we're going to have Jerry Falwell stand up and bless oh, this flight. Oh, Give me another one. And now we're going to have Kenneth Copeland stand up and bless. <laughs> now we're going to have Jesse Duplantis stand up and bless this flight. Wouldn't that be awesome? But no, that would never happen because they have their own jets. Anyway, Isaiah 64, the first half of verse 6 says this. 
But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. Mm. When you think you're all that, God has a way of reeling you back in. Because if you study in the Hebrew and go back and look at the disgusting nature of those filthy rags, it will surprise you. The true, disgusting, filthy nature of those cloths and how they appear, how your righteousness appears before God. So, you let go of it. <clears throat> look at yourself, an unworthy sinner saved by grace. That's all God wants. That he can use. So the point is, reading from my notes, that if you get a big head and start thinking you're something special and it's reflected in your actions and prayers, then your actions and prayers begin to stink before God. God is rather looking for that individual that will always consider himself as a child before God, not deserving the least of his mercies, but grateful that the Lord even took thought to create him. Listen to your own prayers and ask God for guidance. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yep. Amen? Shall we continue? Luke 18, verse 15. Then they also brought infants to him, that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means inherit it. So imagine Jesus, and it just cracks me up every time I read it, with his 12 disciples around him. They got their black sunglasses on. They got their radios. Watch out to the left there. Little kids running up. Oh, little kids. Get the little kids. Oh, watch out for the Lord. Get him, get him away. And like a secret service trying to protect the president and block out these little kids. And Christ says, I will have none of that. Let the kids run up to me. Don't you know he's the one it's written about that says, I'm the one who formed them and created them in the womb? That before they were even born, the Lord knew every one of their days? For those who are lucky enough to be born? Yeah. Reading my notes, do not ever stop or interrupt someone coming to Christ. Amen. Even though they might not be doing it your way. Mm. Mm. Some people pray a sinner's prayer. Some people don't believe in a sinner's prayer, but you've got to have it spontaneously come from within you. Who cares? Is the person coming to Christ? Then let them come to Christ and don't forbid them, lest you find yourself with that millstone wrapped around your neck and drowning in the depths of the sea. <coughs> Just let them come to Christ. That's your mission. Be the fisherman, let God clean the fish. You just get him in the boat, doggone it. How does a child, reading from my notes, how does a child receive gifts at Christmas or on their birthday? Think about that. How does a child receive a gift at Christmas time or on their birthday? When, when you have a party, Christmas morning, either one, you look at those kids and it's time to open presents, what are they doing? <laughs> They're waiting for what's theirs. Did they work for that gift? <coughs> Did they earn that gift? But they're running after it as if it's theirs, as if they just worked 15-hour shift for that gift. And you better pay me my gift. They're, they're running after it with that, like, hey, tenacious, that's mine. Where's my gift? What am I getting? They did not earn that. They didn't go out and work for that gift. But look at how they receive it. How do they receive food at mealtimes? You know, you, you never see it where the parents have food on their plates and the kids have nothing, do you? You always see food on the kids' plates because it's expected. It's received like that. Like, hey, where's, where's my food? You, you never find the kids' plate empty. How do they receive it? Like almost as if they earned it, but they didn't earn it. They didn't work for it. They just simply receive it. And a lot of times they might not even say thank you. They just receive. And God says, don't you know, that's how my kingdom is. It's like a big gift. And all I want you to do is just receive and enjoy it. 
And if you find it within your heart, like that one leper, the Samaritan out of the ten who was healed, to run back and thank Jesus for it, mm -hmm. all the better. To thank him for his salvation, for the washing away of your sins. For when you think about hell, to know I ain't going there. That joy that fills your heart. So when a child, and read for my notes, when a child receives a new toy, many times they show and brag to their friends. Then they invite their friends to play with them. Maybe we should brag a little more about Jesus and ask others if they want them to. Don't you know that? Come look at my toy. Look at my new Xbox. Look at my new iPhone. Whatever. I can't say Tinker Toys, Legos, and, and Tonka Trucks anymore because kids don't play with that stuff anymore. <laughs> um, but that's what we used to do. Go play with each other's toys. Look at this. Look at this. And go from house to house. You know, play with each kid's toys because it was fun. And the, the Lord should be the same way for us that when we receive Jesus and we receive that washing and forgiveness of our sins, that joy needs to be let out and ask others, hey, do you want to know my Jesus too? Because it is outrageous. We left off on verse 18. Luke 18, 18. And we're going to read down to verse 30. Luke 18, 18 says this. Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth up. I was a perfect kitty at all my green beans. Verse 22, so when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, Who then can be saved? As if the rich had a monopoly on salvation. Verse 27, But he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, See? We have left all and followed you. So he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. That was a lot. Let's take it apart piece by piece. So this rich young ruler is coming to Jesus, and he says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why is he asking Jesus? Why don't the religious leaders of the day have the answer? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, whoever they were, why? Why is it the people can't search within their own church for the answer? They have to go elsewhere. To this person who has a reputation for being born illegitimately. Who has a reputation for being a rebel. They're going to that Jesus. For the answer to eternal life? If I was a Pharisee, I'd be pretty upset. And I'd have to wonder, where did I go wrong? What am I doing? That they're not coming to me for the answer. I should be the one they're coming to. But the Pharisees couldn't help him. So this man comes up to Jesus and calls him good. And the man says, do you realize what you just, or Jesus says back to the man, do you just realize what you said? Call me good, will you? Are you aware then that I am God? That's what Jesus is saying. He's not, he's not denying his deity. He's asking the man, are, are you sure you understand what you're saying? Remember when Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Peter had a divine revelation. 
He's comp Jesus is complimenting this rich young ruler. You too have had a divine revelation. Do you understand what you're saying? The depth in calling me good. You are calling me God. Do you realize that? First of all. What commandments did Jesus leave out? You know the ten. The ten commandments. So he mentioned five. What are the five he left out? Number one. Number two. Number three. Number four. And number ten. Are the five commandments Jesus left out. Now that's fascinating. When you, when you read what they are. First one, worship, uh, have, or worship no other gods. The next one, don't make any other gods. Number three, don't take his name in vain. Number four, honor the Sabbath. All these dealing with our relationship with God, not man. And lastly, lastly, thou shalt not covet. So the Lord made a distinction <laughs> It is so fascinating when you understand the depths of the Word of God and you realize this. In Hebrews it says, they shall not the Word of God. It cuts. It separates. It's like a two-edged sword. And the Lord rightly divided this Word of God and it did exactly as it was supposed to do. It cut right to the heart. The Lord gave him the five exactly he knew he would have the answer for and held back the five commandments he knew he wouldn't have an answer for. And he spoke these five, and the man said, Oh, yeah, I scored big. I've kept all those from my youth up. And then the Lord goes, Here it comes. The other five. Your relationship with God and where's your heart? Because his faith was not in God. His faith was in his possessions and what he possessed. And God said, God the Son, right in front of his face, said, that is not good enough. It's not good enough that you honored your mother and father. It's not good enough that you did all these other things from a youth up. That ain't going to cut it. Because your works are like a pile of filthy rags in comparison to the righteousness I demand from you. So God goes a little farther in his dealing with them. Um, I think that's just fascinating the way the Lord did that. It wasn't so much a matter of doing something, reading from my notes, as changing your heart. He asked, what shall I do? Answer, repent. And bear the fruit of repentance, which was for him selling all he had. That would have been the fruit of his repentance his sin of coveting and for not keeping his relationship with the real God instead of his silver and gold. Mm -hmm. Verse 27 said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God because you can't save yourself. You can't do anything to save yourself. It's impossible, Jesus says, for you to save yourself. It required sinless blood. It required an innocent death. That's where we get to heaven. From my notes I wrote, man can't change his own heart. It takes the Holy Spirit's work to convict you. It takes God to draw you. And it takes Jesus to wash you. It's a work of God in your life to save you, not you yourself. In, in Ezekiel, and the man could have known this too, if he had read his word. In Ezekiel 36 it says this, Ezekiel 36, verse 22 through 27 says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in the midst of the nations, in, in, in their midst, and the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hollowed in you before their eyes, for I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle you clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, I will take the heart of stone 
out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Wow. So if the rich young ruler had read that, he would understand that, wow, and, and other verses that say the heart above all is desperately wicked, who can know it? He'd realize the Lord was, was springing or setting a trap for him when he listed those five commandments that he could follow or did follow, but not the other five. He could have recognized right away, oh, there's a problem with my heart. What I like about those verses is the Lord never withdrew his law, but he empowered us to follow it. It's with our old, old stony heart, people might say, well, I've been good. I've kept the Ten Commandments. Yeah, baloney. Okay, first of all, without the Holy Spirit within you, you can't do it. You can't. You just can't. But with the Holy Spirit's help, he says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments and do them. And the people were like, oh, wow, that's the answer. It's his spirit. And don't you know when you ask Jesus into your heart, that's the spirit that floods you. And what Galatians 2.20 said, what Paul said, is what comes to life in you. Um, I'm going to read that real quick. Yep, you're right on the mark. Eight till. Okay, thank you. See you next week. Oh, see you next week. Okay, then. <laughs> Galatians 2.20 says this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the motivation. That's the source of the power we have to live the life that we live as a Christian. It's not natural. It's supernatural. Because in the natural, none of us would be able to keep that. <laughs> Verse 31. So back to Luke 18. Pick up where we left off. Verse 31. Luke 18, 31 says this. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon, and they will scourge him and kill him. And the third day... He will rise again. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. I got really short notes, only two and a half lines on this. Jesus would fulfill all that was written of him. Nothing was going to escape that. Remember what Isaiah 53 said was written about him? He was going to fulfill that. Remember what Psalm 22 said, the first half especially? He was going to fulfill all that. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And such, I'm surrounded by the bulls. I'm surrounded by the dogs. They're surrounding me. Remember what Genesis 3 said? How he was going to crush the head of Satan, even though Satan would bruise his heel? He was going to fulfill that. Remember what Exodus said about him being the Passover lamb? He was going to fulfill that. Remember about Ruth's kinsman redeemer? He was going to fulfill that. Etc., etc., etc. All that was written about him, he was going to fulfill. He is our wheel within the wheel from Ezekiel. All that. It's Jesus. He said, I'm going to do this. And they, for some reason, they just they couldn't get it. They couldn't grasp it. At the time, later on, after his resurrection, it all made sense. And just start clicking when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, if you try and read this, it will not make sense to you. It was written by the Holy Spirit. It takes that same Holy Spirit to read it back to you. 
I read or I heard when Chuck Missler was talking about that, he described it really technically, really above my head, in talking about how lasers can etch a picture in a piece of metal, and then when you look at that metal, you can't see anything because it's blank. It takes the light, that same frequency to shine on it, to reveal the picture that was etched on it with the laser. Now, the funny thing is, it, because it was laser etched, it's etched in 3D. In other words, you can turn that picture, turn that, that piece of metal, and the picture will turn, and you can see it in three dimensions. What's behind, you can see, because that laser etched that whole picture in there in three dimension. But it takes that same frequency of light for you to see it back. The other regular lights just won't work. You need that one certain frequency to reveal that picture. Now the interesting thing was, he, he went on and he said, you can even cut a square of that piece of metal out and throw the rest away. And if you look on that metal, if you bend it far enough, you can see the whole picture because all the information is etched all throughout that whole piece of metal. So even if you have a, pic, a, a fragment, you still get the whole message. I found that fascinating. His point was, even if you just have the book of John, there's enough there to save you. You don't need to have Genesis through Revelation to accomplish salvation. If you have a portion of Romans, you could be saved. There's just parts of it. Isaiah 53, if you knew there's somebody coming to suffer, even in Daniel, where it says he died, but not for his own sins. Strange. The whole picture is etched in the whole word. Fascinating, the word of God. But he came to fulfill it all, and this part that was hidden from them would soon be revealed. Tragically, but it would be revealed. Verse 35 to the end. So Luke 18, verse 35 to the end, says this. Then it happened as he was coming near Jericho that a certain blind man sat by the road begging. And hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Who? Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth. Now listen to this. And he <laughs> cried out saying, Jesus of Nazareth? No, he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went before warned, verse 39, warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, praised God. Fascinating. From what I understand, it was either in the dust or result of the smoke from their burning. But sometimes people would lose their sight in that region. He wasn't born blind. He lost his sight because of his environment. And he wanted to receive it back to be restored. And that's what the Lord did. He did not only heal people born blind. He healed people who lost their sight. I digress. Son of David, what's the big deal? What's the big deal about calling him Son of David? Well, that was a term reserved for the Messiah. They never said the Son of David's coming. They said, oh, Jesus of Nazareth is coming. This man, again, had a revelation. The Lord is doing this all the time. He's just dropping these nuggets in Peter. He just dropped one in the guy who we just talked about, the rich young ruler who called Jesus good. Have you had a revelation? Because you know that means I'm God. This other man just called him the Messiah, essentially. And that's why they quieted him down. He said, hush, hush, hush. He cried all the more louder, son of David. He left off the Yeshua and just called him Messiah. Savior, anointed one, have mercy on me. It, that's why they tried to shut him up, is not all believed Jesus was the Messiah. So the Lord, now this is fascinating. This is fascinating. The Lord backs up the preaching of the gospel with signs and wonders. Was there a question about his Messiahship in that crowd? Obviously. Because when he was challenged, when it came time for rubber to meet the road, he said, yeah, 
I'm the Messiah. Receive your sight. Yes, I'm God who can forgive sins. Get up and walk. Yes, yes, yes. Lazarus, come forth. All these things. Yes, God can still the wind and the waves. Watch this. Wind be still. In fact, I'll show you this. I'm going to walk on him. And so he does all this. Why? To validate the preaching of the gospel. Miracles flowed. So this man believed he was the Messiah, reading from my notes. Others did not and tried to shut him up. Then Jesus heals him, validating his faith, being in the right place. Your faith has made you well. Your faith is in the right place. You calling me Messiah is correct. That, what he was saying, was true. That Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And the only, only way to get to heaven. No other name was given by which men must be saved. If you believe this, then your faith will save you because it is founded upon Jesus. That's my message. That concludes our study for today. And when you go into these scriptures and really look deep and you discover these fascinating little tips, I think it's just it's outrageous. It's wonderful when you look deep into here. What does it mean that he was calling him son of David? And you just research and look into that. Um, and it's just so eye-opening. And you begin to realize what was the rub? What was the challenge? What was going on here? What was the big deal? It was a challenge to his messiahship. They tried to shut him up. And Jesus, again, would have none of it. <laughs> you call me Messiah? You're right. Your faith is in me? Good place for it. Receive your sight. And wouldn't you have liked to have seen that moment, the instant, the man opened his eyes, and what does he see? I, I can just imagine as he's opening his eyes, he sees Jesus looking right back at him with a big, like, childlike grin. It's like, yeah, yeah, see? Just the awesomeness that we need to look into the face of Christ. And, and just, and he must have given him a hug or something like that. I just can't imagine the expression of joy between the two of them when this man just saw Jesus the one who healed them, the first thing he saw when he opened his eyes. Fascinating. So when you receive Christ, the same joy as you see him, the one who washes you from your sins, should fill your heart. Don't let it stay there. Let it out. Let your joy, like your light, shine before men, that they may see your good works and your Father's works in you, and rejoice and give glory to God, because that's what happened here. The end of the story, they <clears throat> praised God. For these works. I don't know how Jesus did it, but he did it in such a way that it didn't draw attention to himself. Isn't that fascinating? He healed this man in a way that they didn't say, oh, look at what Jesus did. They praised God. And that must have just tickled him pink inside to see people restoring their relationship with the Father and praising God for his good works. That's the message for today. Take this joy and let it flow from you. Unspeakable and full of glory. See you again next week. We'll go over chapter 19, the triumphal entry. Read up on Daniel for some clues about that. See you later.